Thanks very much, Rebecca. Well, I wanted to uh, explain five concepts that I think will help explain the, the role of forests in climate mitigation, how we can best manage our land sector, in particular forests, for climate mitigation. And of course our goal is reducing the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And we can use forests or terrestrial ecosystems in two main ways. The first is to avoid emissions, so to protect long-term carbon stocks in terrestrial ecosystems, particularly biodiverse natural ecosystems. Protect, protect these carbon stocks and avoid them being emitted to the atmosphere. The second way is to replant and grow more trees and so sequester carbon, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Oops. Okay. Um, now, I think it's important to just briefly look at our terrestrial ecosystems in the context of the global carbon cycle to, to help to understand how the carbon cycles through the land, oceans and atmosphere and how to control the magnitude and stability of these carbon stocks affect either our emissions or our sequestration rates. So this diagram is not necessarily to, to scale, it's just to illustrate these are the different um, reservoirs of carbon in that global cycle. And to look at the land sector and to realise that um, about 35% of the carbon dioxide that's currently in the atmosphere has actually come from the land sector um, over the many hundreds of years of land clearing. And so that's why I have a, a green section in the atmosphere. That's carbon that's come from the land. And then the, the other part of the additional carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has come from fossil fuel emissions. So that protecting the carbon in the land sector, in, in that reservoir, is an important way of uh, reducing the amount of emissions going to the, to the atmosphere. Now, when we're looking at um, forms of removal of carbon from the atmosphere, of course, it's very important to reduce emissions from fossil fuel combustion. But <coughs> the other way of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is to replant the terrestrial vegetation and soils and to try and take out more carbon in the land sector. However, that should be considered as refilling that land stock it's like a buffer, refilling that buffer. It does not offset the carbon dioxide that's been emitted from the fossil fuel stock because that's a different stock. It's all carbon, it's the same element. But we have to recognise the fact that some of the carbon had originally come from the land sector and we need to be putting it back in the land sector. It doesn't offset carbon that's been emitted from a fossil fuel stock. And so in this diagram where I've put back the, a top green striking um, band in the land sector, it means that um, some of that carbon can be sequestered back into the land, but I've left a white section because we can't put back the original amount of carbon into the land sector because we do actually, because of human population needs, we need to produce food, fibre, um, land areas for housing, and so we can't completely revegetate all the land. So we'll never completely refill that buffer. Now, my second concept is to think about carbon accounting as a total ecosystem carbon accounting. But we do need to account for all the stocks of carbon and flows between those uh, stocks within the land sector. We can't just take out one part like living vegetation and measure that because we're missing many other parts. And this total carbon stock includes 
living biomass, so trees and the understory and ground covers, which are small components but it's all part of the total stock. The dead biomass, this is very often missed when people are, are missed, uh, measuring, uh, say, forests. They may measure the trees, but they don't measure the coarse woody debris and the litter and the dead standing trees, which are all contributing to the total stock of carbon. And of course, the soil. It's a very large component of the land sector carbon stock is in the soil. And the cycling of carbon through these pools is through uptake from the atmosphere, through photosynthesis, decomposition, respiration, the heterotrophic respiration is through microbial activity from the decomposition of dead biomass and soil organic matter, and autotrophic respiration is the uh, respiration from living plants. So we need to account for all of these components of stocks and flows in doing full carbon accounting. And we need to take account of the longevity of these stocks. How long does the carbon actually stay in these different pools? And how does that compare with other stocks, either in fossil fuels or in the ocean? And different parts of the land sector will have very different longevities of the carbon. So, for example, um, the woody biomass in trees, that carbon stays there for many, many decades, often centuries whereas the carbon in the leaves will turn over every year or two or three years, so that's a much shorter pool. So loss of the leaves is not as critical as loss of um, wood biomass. Right, the third concept is about how these carbon stocks change, specifically in a forest, if we compare a natural forest with a forest that is used for timber harvesting. So when we look at that change in carbon stock, we need to start at the level of what the natural forest was. So that's, um, see, natural forest, in this case, it's about 100 tonnes of carbon per hectare. This is an example I've used from data I've collected in mountain edge forests in Victoria, so that they, it is um, a real example but they're quite high carbon stocks compared with um, many other forests in Australia. So if that forest is harvested, we reduce the amount of carbon uh, by removing timber from, um, from the site, but also um, a large proportion of the trees that are cut down, the branches, the stumps, uh, the bark, the understory, is left on the site because it's not useful as a wood product. And that uh, carbon in that part of the biomass will fairly rapidly decompose and be emitted to the atmosphere. There's also loss of carbon from the soil because when machinery is um, driven over the soil and um, churned up, respiration rates in the soil are greatly increased. So there is a, a loss of carbon from the soil. There's accelerated decomposition of biomass that remains on site. And then we need to take into account the longevity of the wood products, and I'll come to that in the next slide. So if we have a rotation here of 80 years, we can see that there's a great, de a very massive decrease in the carbon stock from your natural forest. Then as, after it's been harvested, then that forest will regrow and if our rotation length is every 80 years, then it will decrease again every 80 years. Not to zero, because there is some biomass and soil carbon remaining at the site. So that's the brown uh, dashed line, is if the forest was used for uh, rotation of timber harvesting. It will never get back to the original natural forest carbon stock, if it is continually harvested because the trees are never allowed to grow to be as large and as old. And if we want, and in this example, the maximum carbon stock in the harvested forest when it's at its maximum age is about 60% of the natural state. Of course, over a landscape that's harvested in patches, the actual carbon stock at any one time is 
half of that, it's the, the average of that, so it would be about 30% of the uh, carbon stock in the natural forest. This diagram shows where the losses of carbon are in a harvesting system. We start with the top box, we had 100% um, of the carbon in biomass. So this is not accounting for losses in soil, it's just the biomass carbon. The, the forest is harvested. Again, this is an example from mountain ash forest. A large proportion is waste material. Only 40% goes into merchantable products. And then of that 40%, only 11% goes into saw logs and the remaining into pulp. And at each stage here, carbon dioxide is being emitted from either combustion or decomposition of waste material. The fourth concept is to do with ecosystem biodiversity and what is defined as a forest in the current Kyoto Protocol and in many of the carbon accounting rules. There, a forest is defined structurally as trees over a certain height and canopy density. So a plantation is the same as a natural forest. So that this means that the longevity, the stability of the carbon stocks, the biodiversity in the ecosystem, how that confers resilience to allowing adaptation to climate change, none of that is taken into account because a forest is just a structural category of trees. And this is a real issue when we're trying to do carbon accounting for these international and national rules that doesn't take into account many of the other uh, values and qualities <coughs> of that carbon. Okay. The last of the concepts is to do with the impact of wildfire on carbon stocks because there are a lot of, especially after the Victorian 2009 fires and other major wildfires in Australia, there have been many questions about, well, how much carbon is lost and isn't it similar? You lose carbon in a wildfire, you can lose carbon if you harvest the forest. The studies that I've been working on have been to actually measure how much carbon was lost in some of these mountain ash forests that were burnt in Victoria. And these slides just illustrate um, what is left after selective harvesting and burning the slash, what was left after a mature forest was burnt in the wildfire compared with an unburned site. And you can see that most of the carbon in the trees is still there because the forest is burnt. In, for mountain ash, a lot of the trees are killed where it's high severity fire, but of course not all the area that was burnt was high severity. More than half of the Central Highlands mountain ash forests was burnt at what is called low severity. And there, most of the ash trees were not killed. Even if they were killed, as in this photo, most of the biomass remains on the site. It's dead, but the carbon wasn't lost. And in these high severity burnt areas, between 9 and 14% of the biomass carbon was lost. In the low severity areas, it's about 7%. So it's actually quite a small percentage. Now, of course, these dead trees will eventually fall over, become coarse woody debris, logs on the ground, and will decompose. But then the trees are regenerating as well, so that in the long term, the carbon is being replaced. And it is in no way equivalent to the carbon lost from timber harvesting. Now, briefly, some conclusions. Protecting and regrowing forests is vitally important as the land sector contribution to climate change mitigation. And as well as the climate mitigation, there are many other co-benefits to do with natural resource management and the ecosystem services that are provided for, but from biodiversity, from water catchments, from aesthetic values, and uh, for community recreation. Secondly, <coughs> assessing the value of carbon mitigation activities 
must be based on comprehensive ecosystem carbon accounting systems. The current systems that are used in national and international rules are not sufficiently comprehensive. They don't distinguish the quality of carbon stocks, the differences between um, land sector stocks and fossil fuel stocks, and so that there are many errors being made because the accounting system is not comprehensive. And the quality of carbon stocks measured in terms of their longevity and resilience is critical in assessing the climate change benefits from the mitigation activities. So we need to distinguish between the values of biomass and soil carbon and the longevity and resilience that they confer to an ecosystem as compared with the fossil fuel or geocarbon which should be accounted for in a separate system and not offset um, the bio and the geocarbon. Okay. Thank you.